It's my privilege to be able to share the Word of God with you tonight. My name is Bill Canfield. I'm a senior elder here at World Harvest Church. My privilege to be here. Now, it, I, I, I tell people all the time, I say it's a tremendous privilege to be asked to, to preach anywhere, but it's an even greater privilege to be asked to do that again. <laughs> and I'm telling you, this is the most awesome place right here, World Harvest Church. No place like it in the world. And I thank God for this opportunity. Pastor Parsley has honored us with his presence here tonight. Mrs. Parsley is here. Our first daughter, Ashton, is here. Hallelujah. I always feel better when Dad's home. Amen? Amen. Stretch your hands out toward him right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the healing power of God that is at work in our pastor's body from the top of his head to the soles of his feet, causing him to be well and whole. Oh, we come against every ungodly kind of side effect that would try to attach itself to him. And we thank you for the healing virtue of the Lord Jesus Christ, causing strength to come into his body and healing and cure in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Somebody say hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. You may be seated. What a tremendous, tremendous blessing it is to be able to be here and to be able to share the Word of God with you. And uh, somebody said, well, when Pastor Parsley's there, we know he's in charge, but who's in charge when Pastor Parsley's not there? We say, he is. Praise God. That's real simple. Amen. Somebody said, are you nervous about him being here? No more nervous than I am when I know he's watching online. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Glad to see you here on a Wednesday night in the middle of summer. Every single one of you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Now, if you're here for the first time and, and you haven't ever been here before, you'll find a little white card in the pew in front of you. Take a moment and fill that out for us if you would. You can leave it with us before you uh, make your uh, exit tonight. And uh, we'll believe God with you for God's best to be yours in every area of your life. Open your Bibles with me very quickly. We are on a one-hour Wednesday tonight. And so we're going to get right into the Word of God. I want you to open your Bibles to Psalm 150, the 150th division of the Psalms. I'm going to take a text real quickly, and then we'll go on from there. Psalm 150. Of course, our topic is the Psalms, and I want to just kind of give you an introduction to them tonight. Psalm 150. I'm going to read it from the King James Version of the Bible. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the psaltery and harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals. Praise Him upon the high-sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Go ahead and take an opportunity to do that right now. Come on, you don't want to miss an opportunity to praise God when He's here in the midst of His people. You never know what it is that your praise is going to break you out of. Now, it's one thing to praise God when you're all by yourself, but when you got the agreement of your brothers and sisters in the Lord, you go ahead and take that opportunity to lift your voice in the middle of the congregation and glorify God. Hallelujah! Thank you! We need to be a thankful people. Amen? Hallelujah. God's done so much for each and every one of us. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to talk to you just a little bit about the Psalms. We're beginning our study. It's going to last for a few weeks, and I just want to give you an introduction. I want to look at some concepts that it contains and examine some of the influence it has upon us even today. Of course, there were three divisions of the Hebrew Scriptures. The Law, of course, the first five books of the Bible, uh, known as the Pentateuch, the, and, and then the Writings, that's the second division, uh, the Proverbs and the Book of Job and the Psalms and some others, and then there are the Prophets. So three divisions 
to the Hebrew Scriptures, what we know as the Old Testament. The Psalms, of course, are a part of that division that we call, uh, or that the, the ancient Hebrews called, the writings. And it's a collection of 150 prayers, poems, hymns, and songs used in Hebrew worship. It's divided into five sections, and uh, some people feel that those five sections correspond to each of the books of Moses, starting with Genesis and ending in Deuteronomy. And uh, each of those sections, you notice when each of those sections ends, because it ends with a kind of a, a doxology, a kind of little capstone on the end. And we read the ultimate doxology that was given there, Psalm 150, as our text tonight. And uh, Psalms was used as a worship hymnal in ancient Israel. It was, it, that's what it was used for. That was its purpose. And uh, Psalms, I want you to know, and this is something that I think is an important point to make, it was acknowledged as authoritative by no less an authority than the Lord Jesus Christ because of all the books of the Hebrew Scriptures that he could have chosen to quote from, to, to talk about, to refer to, he quoted from Psalms more than any other book in our Old Testament in the Hebrew Scriptures. Jesus had favorites. His favorite book in the writings was Psalms. His favorite book in uh, the, the law was Deuteronomy, quoted from that more than any other of the five books of Moses. And his favorite book of the prophets was Isaiah. He quoted from Isaiah more than any of the other prophets. Now, those weren't the only books that he limited himself to. He knew the Scriptures. Somebody say amen. amen. By the way, if you haven't been keeping up with your Bible reading on a daily basis on version, uh, you need to get caught up. Somebody said, well, I'm not sure I can catch up the six months that I'm behind. Well, don't worry about that. Start where you are right now, okay? Praise God. We started the second half of the year. You can finish strong. Amen? Praise God. But keep up with your reading of the Scriptures on a daily basis. And one of the, one of the readings in those daily Scripture readings is a portion of the Psalms. Matter of fact, we just started the Psalms over again. And we were in today, I think it was Psalm 11. Psalm 11. And uh, so you can keep up with us and uh, you can get a portion of the Psalms every single day. But Jesus... Uh, quoted Psalms 11 times altogether, a couple of times in the same context. And I just want to go through some of these with you. He, when he fed the multitude, he quoted Psalm 78, verse 24. And I'm not going to take time to, to, to read all of these, but I, I just want you to know that Jesus felt that the Psalms were authoritative enough to refer to them over and over again during his earthly ministry. <laughs> If Jesus can refer to them, if they could help him, my brother and sister, I have a feeling they can help you too. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So he referred to them when he was feeding the multitude. He referred to, the, to Psalm 78, verse 24. He referred to the Psalms when the Jews wanted to stone him by quoting Psalm 82, verse 6. He predicted his betrayal to his disciples by quoting Psalm 41 verse 9 he claimed that he was the chief cornerstone of the building that God was building by the way you and I every one of us who knows Jesus Christ as our Savior is a part is a stone in that building with Jesus being the chief cornerstone hallelujah the Bible refers to you as living stones not dead bricks bricks are all the same size they're all the same shape stones are all different hallelujah and it requires the service of a wise master builder to fit stones together in a way that follows his plan and gets everybody together in a way where they fit with each other. And let me just say, every now and then a stonemason has to chisel some pieces off those stones. Hallelujah. So if you want to keep all your sharp corners, I'm going to move on. Hallelujah. He outwits the Pharisees by quoting Psalm 8, verse 2, and Psalm 110, verse 1. He predicted Jerusalem's destruction by quoting Psalm 118, verse 26. He said he was hated without a cause by quoting both Psalm 35, 19, and 69, verse 4. He responded to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor who was examining him, by quoting or referring to Psalm 110, verse 1. And then, when he was on the cross, 
Two of the seven statements that Jesus made, and you can read all about the statements that Jesus made from the cross, the words that he spoke from the cross in Pastor Parsley's book, The Cross, One Man, One Tree, One Friday. If you don't have a copy of that book, I wonder if you're, well, never mind. If you don't have a copy of that book, get it. And don't just get it, but read it. It'll be a blessing to you. But two of the seven statements that Jesus made from the cross were from the Psalms. And uh, one of them was Psalm 22, verse 1, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then again, that was the fourth statement from the cross. The last thing that Jesus said before he died was Psalm 31, verse 5, Into thy hands I commit my spirit. Hallelujah. Can you imagine? He died with the word of God from the Psalms on his lips. Pretty impressive book, the Psalms. And uh, so the Psalms were written by 73 of them by David, 12 of them by Asaph, 10 of them by the sons of Korah. Solomon wrote one or maybe two of them. Ethan and Heman wrote a couple of them. Moses wrote one. And then we don't know who wrote the rest of them, 50 or 51 of them. Don't have any designations for their author. They were written all the way from Moses' time, Psalm 90, written by Moses, to the captivity of Israel, Psalm 130, uh, actually captivity of Judah, Psalm 137. A time span of 1,000 years, the Psalms were written. And yet, all of them coordinate together to show a wonderful picture of God and his care for his creation. Now, a question that people ask is, well, since these things were written so long ago, are they still relevant? <laughs> My brother and sister, men wrote these things responding to life's events and circumstances. These are people that went through stuff just like you and I go through stuff. Somebody say amen. amen. They were written while calling upon God in faith. They cover the entire range of human experiences and emotions. And in every case, the writers of Psalms counted on God's favor, on his faithfulness, on his mercy, and on his grace. They always look to God with an expectation. They always look to God with an anticipation. They always look to God with eyes of faith. Now, uh, the Psalms have been an inspiration to people for generations, ever since they'd been written. I already, already mentioned that they were used as a songbook of ancient Israel. They were used in temple worship. In the first century, many believers, of course, were Jews, and they depended and relied upon the Psalms as a source of inspiration and encouragement. And throughout church history, Psalms have been inspiring men and women. In the Reformation and beyond, as different groups began to develop, they had different styles of worship. The Lutherans and the Moravians tended to put their music in vernacular, that is, in the common everyday speech of the people that they were around. Calvinists, the followers of John Calvin, on the other hand, said, well, we've already got a song book. We don't need another one. And so they put the entire book of Psalms, all 150 chapters of them, into verse and then put that to music, and that was the Calvinist's songbook. Well, there was a great deal of, of uh, disagreement in the body of Christ and discussion about which way was right and which way was proper. And uh, to some extent, that, that controversy still continues. But over a period of time, hymnals began to be developed. That is a collection of music that were, became popular for people to sing. And one of the most famous was the Geneva Psalter, which was developed in the 1500s. And its final collection was in 1562. And uh, it there is a, there's a song from the Geneva Psalter that you still know. It's called the doxology. Hallelujah. It's come all the way down to us from the 1500s. It's the most amazing thing. Music has qualities about it that influence people far beyond the time in which they were written. And let me just share this with you. Harvest Music Live just came out 
with their brand new uh, music project called Light the World on Fire. Amen. We've already seen it reverberating across the country and around the world, and I believe that it's going to influence an entire new generation of believers and musicians and singers. Amen. It's, and if you haven't got one, by all means, you need to get it. I think they've got, a, they've got a table set up out there in the foyer where you can get one if you haven't got it yet uh, tonight. So uh, Psalm 100 uh, was set to music. Originally, the tune was Psalm 134, and then it was set to another psalm, Psalm 100. And then another guy, a Scottish minister, wrote a song that had 11 verses, and the last verse was what we know as the doxology. And uh, let's see, the doxology, praise God from him whom all blessings flow, praise him all creatures here below, praise him above ye heavenly host, praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It's the most sung Christian song in worship services around the world. It's just the most amazing thing. And it's still, it's still connected to the music that was set to Psalm 100. Somebody said, you mean they use music for more than one song? Pablo Picasso said, good artists borrow, great artists steal. That's what he said. And uh, he would probably know about that. Well, let's talk about some other developments. A young man was on his way to church with his father one time. This was in the late 1600s. And he began complaining about the music. His father said, well, why don't you do something better? The young man was 14 years old. And he said, well, all right, I will. He went home and wrote a hymn that was very well received at 14 years old. The young man's name, he was born in 1674. His name was Isaac Watts. Isaac Watts. He's called the father of modern hymnody. He is credited with writing as many as 750 psalms, or songs, hymns. And many of his hymns, many of his most famous hymns, were influenced directly from the psalms. So they still have an influence even today. He wrote, Oh God, our help in ages past, which was from Psalm 90. He wrote, Jesus shall reign where the sun, from Psalm 72. And one of them you might may have heard of sometime is a little struggling little song that is little known called Joy to the World. That one was from Psalm 98 and is the most published Christmas hymn in North America from the Psalms. Other hymn writers wrote psalms like bringing in the sheaves from Psalm 126, verse 6. He brought me out of the miry clay from Psalm 40, verses 2 and 3. And even today, I remember, I got into this thing in the 1970s. Some of you remember the 1970s. Praise God we made it through the 1970s. Hallelujah. Amen. But I got into this thing in the 1970s. And in the 1970s, one of the things that happened in music in the church was there was a movement away from the traditional hymnal. You know, that great big fat book that had all those songs in it that nobody ever heard of before because they'd been around for 100 years. And they started singing what they called worship choruses. Now, you remember, that's when we got those... Um, when we got those... Uh, overhead projectors and put everything on overhead projector slides and, and put them up on screens and nobody had to hold a hymnal in their, in their hands anymore. Well, many of the hymns that were in the hymnal were inspired by the Psalms, but many of the worship choruses that people started singing in the 1970s and beyond were also inspired by the Psalms. Hallelujah. Now, some of you may not remember those days, but... Uh, maybe some of you will remember uh, from, uh, let's see, Psalm 18, verse 3 and verse 46. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. You don't remember that? Oh, okay, some of you do. Well, it's all right if you sing. The series is called 
We sing. Look at somebody next to you and say, we sing. Now somebody just looked right back at somebody and said, no, you sing. I don't sing. Listen, my brother and sister, one of the problems we have in the contemporary church is something that I thought we got away from a long time ago, and that is where everybody participates instead of just watching one person up there do all the work and everybody here just sits with their arms folded. Now, if you've got your arms folded, I'm probably not talking about you, but I might be. The reason we put the words on the screen is so you can see what it is you're supposed to be singing. Amen. Somebody said, somebody said, well, I don't know that one. Don't worry about it. There's plenty more where that one came from. But a lot of people don't realize that that song and a lot of others like it are taken, lifted right out of the Psalms. And it's okay. Here's one, Psalm 42, verse 1. This one was written in 1981. As the deer... Now, here's the thing about As the Deer. It was a slow song. And boy, the way some people sang it, it was even slower. So I'm not going to get into that one tonight. But just know that that one came from the Psalms as well. Amen. Here's another one from Psalm 47, verse 1. Clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto God with a voice of praise. Yeah! Hallelujah! Come on, somebody clap your hands. You can participate. You can do it. Now here's something we got to get back to, my brothers and sisters. We got to get away from everybody in the congregation thinking that this is a performance. This is not a performance. These people are not performers. Anybody that stands up here on the platform in front of you is not doing that as making this their audition hall. It's not a performance. This is ministry. But the thing is, these people on the platform aren't the only ministers. The word minister means servant. That's what it means. Hallelujah. Now, I've seen a lot of people that wanted a bumper sticker on the back of their car that said minister. I haven't ever seen a bumper sticker that says servant. You ever wonder about that? So here's what I'm telling you. It doesn't matter if the song that they're singing up here is brand new and you've never heard it before or it doesn't matter if it's a hundred years old when they start ministering you start ministering too that means get up start singing open your mouth make a joyful noise clap your hands participate in whatever way you can Somebody said, but I can't sing. God didn't ask you to sing. He asked you to praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I don't, I don't know whether you think you can sing or not, but the fact is you can praise because you got a mouth and you got a voice and you got hands and you've got the opportunity to use what it is that God's placed on the inside of you to give glory to Him. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. My, 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 my. Well, the curtain hasn't come up here lately, but when the curtain goes up or the service begins, you ought to say, you know what? I am going to participate. I'm going to get involved. I'm not just going to stand back or sit back and see if somebody can bless me. I'm going to see if I can bless him because he is the only audience that you need to be concerned about. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, it's just awesome. The Psalms. Uh, let's see. 
Psalm 48, verses 1 and 2. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth, is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great King. Somebody said, I've never heard that one either. You just did. Praise God. <laughs> Somebody said, he don't sing too good. I'm not bashful. Praise God. Enthusiasm makes up for a lot. Hallelujah. <laughs> Somebody said, if you can't sing good, sing loud. Hallelujah. Psalm 60, verse 12, through our God. Psalm 68, let God arise. That was written in 1970. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let God, let God arise. See how easy that is? And somebody... If you stick around long enough, you might start having a good time. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm already having a good time, Wendell. How about you? Yeah, me and Wendell are having a good time. But listen, none of these are the most famous of the scripture choruses. One was written by a fellow from New Zealand, believe it or not, back in 1970. Psalm 118, verse 24. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. And then, you can't sing that one without singing Psalm 100 verse 4. I will enter His gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter His courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. <laughs> Has he made anybody glad in the house? He's made me glad just watching some of you get happy. Hallelujah. First time some folks have smiled for three months. Pastor Parsley takes me back. When we moved into this building in 1987 we were singing some of those songs I know because I was up here leading them for some reason or other <laughs> amen Clint Brown came and I didn't have to do that anymore somebody came up to me and said oh brother Canfield I wasn't an elder then he said brother Canfield I'm so sorry you're not on the platform I said don't feel sorry for me honey I'm the happiest person on the planet that's it <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Let me mention just a couple more. Psalm 103, verse 1. Andre Crouch wrote this one in 1973. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. You remember that one? Amen. Now sometimes the same scripture gets involved in different generations 
And then we come up with, uh, with uh, in 2011, Matt Redman. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. See, it's the same scripture, two completely different takes on it. Hallelujah. Amen. And then, of course, what was known as Jesus music in the 60s and the 70s became known as contemporary Christian music. And Psalm 8, verse 1 became How Majestic, written by Michael W. Smith in 1981. You remember Larnell Harris and Sandy Patty singing How Majestic Is Your Name. And then in 1985, Wayne Watson Psalm 87, verse 6, born in Zion. You may, not have, you may not be as familiar with that one, but that one really ministers to me. Psalm, uh-uh, uh-uh, not that one. Listen, I know my limits, hallelujah. I'll help you with this one. Psalm 63, verse 1 and 2. My soul thirsts for thee. And my flesh yearns for thee in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Thus have I beheld thee in the sanctuary to see thy power and thy glory. Thou, thou art my God. I will seek thee earnestly. I will seek thee earnestly. <laughs> See there. That's from Psalm, what is, what did I say, 63, 1 and 2? Yeah. And that's, that was on a little obscure album by some guy by the name of Matthew Ward. He was a part of a group called the Second Chapter of Acts. Back, they're not touring anymore. They've been, you know, doing other things for a long time now. But see, that's not hard. My brother and sister, somebody said, well, that's easy for you to say. No, there was a time when I couldn't do that. But... It gets easier the more you practice. And listen, you don't have to do that when there's hundreds of people watching you up on a platform under lights. All you got to do is get alone in your car somewhere. All you got to do is get alone in your closet somewhere. All you got to do is spend some time in the presence of an almighty and everlasting God who wants to hear from you. And somebody said, well, I don't know any of those songs. Make up one of your own. Hallelujah. Ah. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't have to get on a praise and worship project. It doesn't have to hit the charts. You singing out of the innermost parts of your being to a God who loves you and sent his son to die for you, you're going to get the applause of heaven. God himself is going to get up off his throne and say, sing that one again, son. I like the sound of that one. Sing that, girl. Sing that one again. Hallelujah.